Today on Black Refresh 2020, we interview world-renowned jazz trumpeter Derek Gardner. He tells us stories about working with some of the giants of jazz. He also says American society can find racial harmony by following a musician's mindset. He jokes that America needs to groove at a gigantic concert and mellow the heck out. All right, welcome back to Black Refresh 2020. I'm your host, Todd Inman. And today we are joined by actually a jazz trumpeter extraordinaire, Mr. Derek Gardner. Uh, thanks for joining us, Derek. My pleasure, my pleasure to be here, Todd. Absolutely, especially, you know, with, with this home confinement, man. So, sometimes we can catch people like yourself these days that we ordinarily wouldn't be able to catch. Oh, I'm telling you, yeah, everybody's at home now. <laughs> everybody's at home. <laughs> and no oh, excuse. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You, can, you can't hide. When, when, you yeah, get my, right. uh, when you get my emails and stuff, you can't hide. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> but uh, anyway, man, it's, it's great to see you again, Derek. Um, so, you know, I guess I, I want to kind of jump right into this. Well, actually, since you did mention home, uh, so you're you're actually uh, in in where in Canada right now? Winnipeg, Manitoba. Okay. And most most people, most Americans will say, where? <laughs> you know? And that's what I said when I first got up here. I was like, where's Winnipeg? You know, uh, I actually mistook you know Winnipeg for the place where the Winter Olympics were. To, uh, you know, years back in Canada, which was Calgary. You know, which right. is a totally different. You know. Two provinces over, you know. Okay. Um, but I'm in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is uh, uh, about 40 miles north of the U.S. border at North Dakota. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So we're like almost smack dab in the middle of the country. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, teaching at the University of Manitoba is that what brought you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a job teaching here. They uh, made a, a, a huge investment in jazz studies uh, at, at the University of Manitoba and really a great uh, friend of mine, a colleague that I performed with when I was living in New York City back in the 90s, named Steve Kirby. And um, he's uh, uh, he came up here and started the program, the jazz studies program up here. And uh, they allowed him to build a faculty and he said he needed a, a trumpet player. And uh, at the time I was, uh, teaching at Michigan State University prior to coming here, and uh, this was a this was a better gig. So I came on I came on up north, up more, further north. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so now just um, for our audience, as far as uh, sort of the the racial makeup of Winnipeg, what was it like? Surprisingly mixed. Ah. Uh, and uh, uh, there are there's a, a surprisingly diverse, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, there. There are quite a few uh, black people here, uh, mainly from uh, Africa and from the Caribbean. And, and, and they've been here for uh, a number of decades, you know, where they have, where they have uh, kids uh, that have grown up, you know, and gone to high school and college and, you know, and get families and everything. And they pretty much just set up camp here in Winnipeg. And, uh, uh, but they are Canadian. And uh, with everything that uh, that Canadian culture is, is embodied with, within them. But they look just like you and me, you know. Okay, so, okay. You know, he's say, you know, go around the corner and see see Tyrone and Ray Ray or whatever, you know, <laughs> hanging out, you know. And yeah. they look just like them. And then when they speak, they sound Canadian, you know. And it's like, oh, wow, okay. So okay. It's, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, what do they call it, Cogniz co cognitive, uh, uh, dissonance, you might say, right, right, you know, right. when 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 you're posting, but 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 the people here in Canada are very very cool and very hospitable, and very friendly, and uh, and it's, it's uh, so it's, it's 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 been a really nice uh, being up here. Okay, and so since you said that uh, there's some people that look like you and me, so I guess you could slip away and get a fresh haircut if if you needed one. Yeah, yeah, you could. Well, I don't have that problem, you know. I could, you know, <laughs> do it myself now. But yeah, yeah, they got a, they got a, uh, quite a few barbers around here where you need to get you to tighten up that. If you're from Philly, you got to tighten up that Philly fade. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ain't quite you know, you, got, 
you got to kind of school them a little bit on the fade now, uh, where you got to go ahead and just blend that in. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that's cool though. That's what's up, man. So, so you know, getting back to uh, you, you know your 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 career and really your life's dedication, which has been uh, being a jazz trumpeter. Uh, w- when did you first, I guess, fall in love with with the instrument? Uh, when I was, uh, I guess, I started playing when I was nine, and I always knew about it prior to that. Both my parents are musicians. Uh, mm. uh, my mom's classical. Uh, pianist and organist and choir director, and uh, while we were at Hampton, uh, well, I, when I, I was quite a few years before you, but mm-hmm. when I when I was at Hampton, my mom was the uh, uh, chairperson of the music department at Hampton, and my father was a jazz trumpeter, mm-hmm. and um, um, and <clears throat> performed with with a lot of uh, iconic names in in in, in, in jazz uh, era jazz arena. And went out on the road in the early '60s with uh, Ray Charles Band during Ray's heyday, you know. Wow. And uh, we're we work with everybody, you know. And so, um, so I would always hear him practicing, uh, you know, improvisation, you know, in the house and downstairs in his uh, in his practice room studio. And then my mom would be upstairs, you know, at the piano practicing classical music and things and they had recordings all over the place. My my uncle, my was my dad's brother, had a uh, had one of the largest uh, record shops, record stores in Chicago, mm. in South Side of Chicago. And uh, so <clears throat> my, my dad would record his own ensembles, his own groups, and his brother was like the the, the distributor for his his records. Mm. You know? And um, so, uh, so music was always all around, all around me, growing up. And when I was in, I started playing piano when I was in, when I was five years old, taking piano lessons. Got kind of bored with that after a few years. And then uh, when I was uh, my, when I was nine, my elementary school band started a band program. And they said, "Who wants to be in the band?" I said, "Oh, I want to be in the band." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Okay, what do you want to play?" I said, "I want, I want to play trumpet." They said, "Well, we." we, we we don't have a trumpet. We'll get you something else. I said, no, no, no. I'll, I'll get one. So I ran home, told my dad, "Hey, I want to play the trumpet." Yeah. He's like, really? You want to play trumpet? Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he got me a trumpet, and I showed up a couple of days later. You know, like, ta-da! Here it is. You know. <laughs> and uh, rest is history, pretty much. Yeah. So, so now, as far as your parents coming from that musical family, did they? I guess. Uh, I mean, obviously, you said they were influential because of what you witnessed and heard every day but did they try to push you into music no no they uh were uh very open to me going whatever direction i wanted to go and uh but i was just uh naturally i just naturally gravitated toward it you know it was just it was all around me and so i think that was like the uh maybe the subliminal kind of uh magnetism that was just driving me toward it Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and you you have siblings? Are they also uh, musicians? Yep, yep. Uh, my I got a younger brother, uh, Vincent, who is the uh, lead trombonist with the uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra in New York mm-hmm. with Wynton Marcellus, and he's also the uh, uh, director of the Jazz Houston Orchestra down in Houston, Texas. He lives down there now, and uh, I got an older sister. Um, uh, Marion, who uh, she's not in music, uh, she teaches in public schools in Portsmouth, Portsmouth, Virginia. And I got an older brother, uh, Lamar, who's down in, in Mississippi, uh, who uh, is in the medical field. Well, we all started off um, playing music, but we didn't. But you know, my older brother and sister went in different directions. Sure, sure. So, so, so now, Derek, as far as you know, you you, you did you finished Hampton University. Um, when did you, I guess, uh, believe that you could make a career and earn money doing this, uh, coming out of school? I always thought, <clears throat> I always felt that I, I always knew that this is what I was going to do. Okay. Um, I didn't really consider anything else. That was just, it was, it was just always just music. And, um, I think that, uh, uh, after I finished Hampton, 
I came out. I came out of Hampton in, in '87, and but before I before I left Hampton, I was like, okay, am I? Is, I'm either going to go, I'm going to go pro, which, which which really meant moving to a place like uh, like New York or Los Angeles or uh, or even like some place like Nashville, Tennessee, mm. you know, where the where the country music scene is there, but that's it's a, uh, all the music business, all the music licensing corporations and things like that are there, and, and all all the music is, is is there in these different music centers, you know. And so <clears throat> I said, okay, I'm either gonna go pro or I'm gonna go back to school and and figure out and and and, uh, and get get better, make sure my stuff is, is tight. So my litmus test was this. Uh, one of my heroes on the trumpet uh, is a cat named uh, Freddie Hubbard. And uh, uh, when I put a final Freddie Hubbard record that I really liked, I put it on I put it on the, on the record player. Um, and we didn't have we didn't have downloads back then, back in the eighties. <laughs> when the music library at Hampton put on the record, I put a needle on it, and I listened for a minute, and I said, "Okay, if I can play like that, then I'm going pro. I'm going to New York." Okay. And so I put the needle on there, listened for about about two minutes. I took the needle off. I said, "Okay, I guess I'm going to grad school." <laughs> so I was like, man, because Freddie was playing so much stuff, man. I was like, God, I thought Freddie's one of our iconic figures of the, of the jazz trumpet. Okay. And so I said, nah, I ain't there yet. So I went back to grad school and went to uh, Indiana University, where they have a, 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 a very historic and storied uh, jazz studies program there that was started by an incredible composer and jazz musician uh, David Baker, uh, who since passed away now. And so I went there and became part of that program and uh, uh, was there for almost for almost two years, uh, but I didn't end up, I ended up not finishing there because I got recruited into the uh, Count Basie Orchestra. Mm. As somebody who appreciates jazz like myself, uh, but doesn't know the history, um, you know, nearly as well as, as you do. In fact, you've lived a lot of history, but uh, some of the jazz greats that you've met, um, did you, you know, kind of learn a couple of tips from them or build a little, you know, kind of uh, friendship and passing? Uh, any any cool stories for us? Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, quite a few. Uh, probably one of the first stories is from a, a gentleman by the name of uh, James Moody, who was uh, 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 an incredible saxophonist and flautist. And he was the uh, um, performed perform with Dizzy Gillespie's band uh, for many, many years and was with, uh, with uh, I think he played in Dizzy's big band and also in Dizzy's quintet that Dizzy toured with for many years. Um, and so, and he had a big hit called uh, Moody's Move for Love uh, that uh, that was just, you know, that was, that was the, <clears throat> uh, that was kind of like the Luther, Van Luther Vandross, the house is not a home of, of the day, you know? Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so I was at, this is my first, one of my first, I think, through my first couple of years with the Basie Band, we were at a jazz festival, and I was backstage warming up. You know, I had my, I found me a little corner, and I was warming up in, in the corner, you know. And then I uh, felt this tap on my shoulder, and turned around, and this guy says, man, hey man, I like, really like the way you sound, man. You playing some nice stuff, man. Yeah, keep, yeah, keep on doing it. I was like, oh yeah, thank you, thank you very much. You know, I went back to playing my stuff, I was like, James Moody, holy crap, you know, I just lost it. Damn, James, you know. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I said, no, I said, I'm not worthy, you know. Yeah. I, said, oh. I was like, oh, man, hi, man, thank you. Oh, man, man, that's yeah. like high praise. He's like, yeah, that's good, man. I like the way you sound some really nice stuff, man. Here, <clears throat> but, you know, let me let me show you something. And so he showed me this, uh, this line that was, uh, uh, that was very, very interviolic. You know, normally we like to play, <clears throat> I get my horn. Normally we'll, uh, you know, we play some like. Yeah. 
you know, something that's, that's kind of like <clears throat> kind of uh, very scalier and, and kind of flows like like that. You know, he was like, do this thing. You know, it was a dee do do dee dee do do dee da that jumps around like that. <clears throat> He's like, yeah, yeah. Take a note, go down to major seventh and go up the tritone, then go there and take that pattern and, and go down uh, and, and major third, minor thirds, fourths, take it all around the key circle and all that stuff. And I was like, oh man, you know, it totally, totally blew my mind. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, he said, now you can take, you can take that and you play it over, over. Uh, uh, major seven chord and sharp eleven, or you can take it, you know, play it over a dominant seven chord, or, uh, sharp nine, sharp five, and just talking, you know, he's out of nailing all this, doing all this theory on me and everything. I think, and it, and it, and it kind of sounded like, you know, I understood most of it, but it was almost like Japanese to me, you know, because <laughs> I, I, I couldn't process it as fast as he was just not, he was dealing with that stuff for the last 50 years. So, <laughs> by, by, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> So when I got to a uh, when I got to a piano uh, later after the after the gig, I started kind of going through the stuff he had did and, and, and played. I was practicing, and I said, "Oh my God!" It just opened up my ears. Just it was it was like it, 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 it was like I got into the top of Mount Everest and. The dude with the big, with the, the monk with the robe on and everything gave me the meaning of life. <laughs> Some of those type of things, you know? Yeah. And, um, I was like, man. So it opened up my whole my ears harmonically, so I was able to, to apply it, you know, and use it in my in my um, concept of improvisation. And then, <clears throat> but about eight nine years later, I saw him in in Chicago. And um, and he was playing at a place called J the Jazz Showcase, and I went to the show and had my horn with me. And uh, I said, uh, I went up to him after the set. I said, uh, Mr. Moody, uh, my name is Derek. He's like Gardner. Wow. Faithy. I was like, Oh, no worries. <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh my God, you remember me? Wow. And, yeah, man. I said, yeah, you're a great drum player. Man. I said, oh, wow. Yeah. So I said, Well, man, look, I. I Practice your thing, and man, I got it, man. So I played it for him, you know, and did all the stuff, you know. And he's like, "Oh, that's good, yeah, okay, I like that." Thing. Now, add some force to that. Bebo, do bo, di da da do, bebo, do di da da. I said, "Oh man!" That would wait ten years for part two. Yeah, you know, and, so, and that's jazz musicians in like old years, man. They do that, you know. That's how they te that's how they teach it, you know. Um, and uh, so yeah, that that you know that that one instance. I got many stories like that, but that one instance just like just totally just blew my mind and opened my ears up and uh, just made me that much better of a musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, yeah. So that's that's one of many stories. That, that's incredible. That's incredible. So now, as far as uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, the heroes or your heroes, I should say, um, you know, some of the, the the biggest names. And it's amazing when I think about, like you talked about Duke Ellington, you, you know, Count Basie, those people back then, that their names are still relevant today. You know, and you know, I, I had thought about this not long ago that they weren't, you know, once in a lifetime artists. These people were once in the Earth's history. You know, yeah. type of artist. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so who are some of like your heroes? Um, you know, that, that that we that people like myself who don't know the history would know. Yeah. Uh, well, um, my well, I got I got I got to start with with, with my dad. Uh, his name is Burgess Gardner, and he, he's frat too. Okay. And, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, and he was uh, my f first initial. Uh, influence and, and incredible trumpeter.
uh, he's a disciple of a uh, trumpeter by the name of Clifford Brown. Okay. And Clifford Brown, uh, back in the uh, like uh, <clears throat> early 1950s, was the trumpet star of the, of the day uh, after Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis. And Clifford came, came in with a whole new uh, way of, of, of playing. And that just, just, just cleared the bench pretty much. And, and that was during the time when my father was, uh, was learning, learning the craft, you know, and he was very, very much influenced by Clifford Brown. So through him, I discovered Clifford Brown. Then you just have like the branch on the tree, like after Clifford Brown, you get into like Phil Philadelphia trumpeter, uh, Lee Morgan, who was very influential on, on, on me. Um, and Lee, so Lee Morgan, and, and then like I mentioned earlier, Freddie Hubbard, um, and then uh, uh, Book a Little, Woody Shaw, uh, who came up with a, a more of an uh, intervallic way of playing, just like, like I displayed um, just a little earlier. Um, and uh, so those are, those are my those are my a handful of main influences that I, that, that, that kind of uh, molded the way that I play now. Yeah, I, would, uh, I would have to I would have to focus on, and of course I was very much influenced by Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie and uh, Miles Davis. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So it's interesting. What just came to mind, you know, you, you were talking about these jazz greats, um, especially when we're talking when we go back to let's say uh, Jim Crow era and, and those type of things, um, you know, l learning some of the history yourself and hearing some of the stories, what was, I guess, so different about their lifestyle and, and their acceptance um, versus maybe some of the easier road that you have to, that you have to travel as a jazz musician today? Well, they're the ones that paved the road. They are the ones that they, they're, they're, they're the ones that clear it. They cleared, cut down the trees, and 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 pulled up all the roots and weeds and everything, and, and laid down the, you know, uh, matted down the soil and put down the asphalt and everything. They made the roads smooth for us, and um, it was <clears throat> it was a hard road to travel because. Uh, uh, well, you know, in, on one sense it was a, it was an easy road, in another sense it was a hard road. You know, within the black community, that was just the music that we played. That was that was our music, and um, and then and it, and it was a dividing line between uh, black and, and, and white music back during. You know, you're talking about after after slavery, on up through uh, Reconstruction and. And on and through the, up to uh, uh, Jim Crow and all those years and everything, you know, there wasn't any any really uh, uh, white interaction with black musicians until around the 1920s, and and even but, but that, that's in America, uh, in maybe about 10 years uh, prior to that. Black musicians were, were were going over to Europe and being featured over there. Europeans heard heard us playing jazz, and they were like, "Oh my God, this is the, this is some of the greatest music in the world." This mm -hmm. is, and they totally embraced it. They treat they they put it on the same on the same level as classical as, as classical music and treated treated us like classical musicians. Um, and they totally embraced it. Totally embraced the music, and then. Americans saw how Europeans were reacting to the music, and uh, the, the, of course, the, the business-minded people saw saw that as a way to to, to monetize the music, you know. And uh, but the musicians started started uh, uh, being influenced by uh, black jazz musicians and black music, and so they started trying to learn how to how to how to play the music, and. Um, um, and so then it, then the road became a little bit easier, uh, as far as like, uh, having, uh, white support, uh, for black music. 
And that's when the music really, black music really starts to just, just infect the entire musical uh, uh, landscape and output of American music. You know, all American, all American music is based off of off of early jazz. Okay. And it all came out of it. Really, it all came out of the blues. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Yeah. All came out. Blues and jazz is like concomitant with each other. It was it, it, it both was happening at the, at the same at the same time. At first, it was all just blues. And, and even prior to that, it was field house and work songs from the slave era mm. and uh, during slavery time. And then after after emancipation, then slaves were uh, former slaves had freedom of movement. They were able to move about the country, and then that affected that tempered the music and allowed it to those field house and work songs turned into the blues, and blues lyrics started to started to you know, be applied to that, to that music. And then, and then that, all, and then this whole big transformation started happening in, in New Orleans, where they started taking like, uh, 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 like uh, church hymns and, and quote unquote, jazzing them up. Mm. You know, like uh, 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 when the saints go marching in. Oh yeah. And just a closer walk with thee, mm. all that stuff, you know, those big, those New Orleans funeral dirges, Okay. You know, when they would they would they play the you know, thing like that. Yeah. You know, they play it real slow going down to the down to the uh, to the cemetery. Yes. You know, on the way back to, to on the way back to go to the picnic ground. And so then, and so then that, that started to, you know, start to evolve into improvisation, and uh, because it was a long way to get from the from the long way to get from the from the uh, cemetery all the way to the picnic grounds. After you play that, you got to keep on playing, so you can't play the same thing over and over again. Now you got to. So you got to, so you got to jazz it up, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and 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 expound upon, you know, take liberties, many liberties with the melody, with the rhythm melody, and so um, so all that just that man that turned into R and B, oh yeah, turned into rock and roll, mm. turned into um, uh, uh, all the music that they that that came afterwards, hip hop. That's all, but it, it's, you know, if you dig, if you dig deep into hip hop and rap music, it all came out of jazz. Yeah. You know, and jazz and blues. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, they, so the answer, come back to your question. Yeah, they, they, they're the ones that paved the road for us, you know, and, and made the road smooth in order for, for it to uh, actually blossom into what it is today. So, so you stand on their shoulders? Of course, without a doubt. So, uh, so t tell me a little bit about uh, the Jazz Prophets. Jazz Prophets is a group that I started about uh, almost 30 years ago. And uh, when I was, uh, actually when I was uh, in, in graduate school at Indiana University, I spoke about it earlier. And um, it's a, it's a, a sextet, six-piece six group, uh, trumpet, trombone, tenor saxophone, piano, bass, and drums. Mm. And uh, and the group is pretty much modeled after uh, 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 the group uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, okay. and who uh, the Philadelphia trumpet player I spoke of, uh, Lee Morgan, uh, played in that group for for many many years and made his name uh, through Art Blakey's group. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at uh, at one point in time, Art Blakey's group consisted of that 
that very instrumentation and that the sound of that group uh, was very influential to, uh, uh, to me as a musician. And that was actually one, that was actually the gig that I wanted for years. I, I dreamed of being uh, a jazz messenger, mm. you know, at one point that, but I got to New York a year too late. You know, he had, uh, when, I, when, I, when I finally got to New York, he had died the year before. Okay. Our Blake had died. And so, um, uh, so I, I began to fashion my group around that sound. recordings uh, that are out there. Uh, first recording is called Slim Goody. Uh, second recording is uh, um, called A Ride to the Other Side. And third one is uh, Echoes of Ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third recording, actually, I expanded the group. Uh, instead of three horns out front, we got five horns out front. Uh, I, added a, I added alto saxophone and baritone saxophone. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a bigger sound going the octet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's awesome, man. So um, now, are you I, I, you considered the conductor, or conductor, composer, arranger, um, a contractor, the musicians, uh, everything? I'm the main <laughs> head chef in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, that, that's, that's terrific. Uh, so uh, you guys still still tour? But you know, obviously, with with you know this home confinement, you're not doing yeah, it yeah, under yeah. normal circumstances. Uh, occasionally, we uh, we do some performances. Um, uh, a lot of my uh, performance time has been has been uh, cut back quite drastically uh, because I'm now take, I'm, I'm I be, uh, have this job teaching, you know, and so I have to adjust my performance schedule with my teaching schedule, and mm -hmm. then also just uh, my, the performance schedule of that band with the performance schedule of, or with the schedule of everybody else in the band, the other five members of the band, you know, they have other things that they're doing to, as well, you know, so uh, we might end up doing uh, maybe about, uh, you know, a couple of gigs a year mm -hmm. at this point, you know, and then uh, um, as if I'm able, if I'm really able to, to focus on it, then we can, we can then we we'll might be able to do like a, a string of, of performances uh, during the summer. You know mm -hmm. when, when people's schedules are, are as much freer. So, you know when you compare your teaching style and your teaching content of the trumpet, um, you know what they get at, at your class at the University of Manitoba, 
maybe other of your peers that teach exactly what you do at other institutions, yeah. kind of what do your students walk away that they say, hey, listen, I, I was in a Derek Gardner class yeah. and, and I learned these things that you probably didn't learn at your other institutions? Sure, sure. Uh, well, you know, I think I can, uh, I, I believe I can boast uh, that, um, that I teach, I teach the trumpet, I teach the instrument itself. And the, the trumpet is the uh, most difficult of the wind instruments for sound production. Mm. Uh, it, it, it encompasses uh, a higher uh, air, air pressure rate and a low and, and, uh, and a lower air flow rate. Which means that you know we have all this, you know. Uh, when you take a breath, you have to go. It's like a yawn. You go like that. You know, you're taking the same. You take a big breath, and you got to put it through that little hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so that's pressure. If you got to go, like if you took a straw, you know, like a McDonald's soda straw, you know. And, and took a big breath and went and tried to blow all that air through that through that straw, you, you get the vein popping out your forehead, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so so you have to figure out how to how to how to relieve that pressure, but yet still put put all that wind through that little hole, through that yeah, yeah. through mouthpiece. Yeah. And and that's and so you have to teach, you have to uh, train the body to breathe. You know, okay. and uh, without getting too uh, uh, too too deep into the, uh, in the into the breathing trumpet breathing workshop, you know, um, is pretty much just a it's like you like you yawn on your inhale and you blow out the birthday can bir the birthday cake candles on the exhale. Yeah, <sighs> you know, yeah. Yeah. but it has to be controlled. <sighs> you have to move the wind forward at all times. You can't you can't hold back on the wind or else the trumpet is gonna is gonna bite you in the ass, baby. <laughs> you know, you know, you, you know, trumpets, you know, you know you'd be doing like that and getting all tension like that, you know, when it should be just you know, and it should and you know most Trumpeters, when they're trying to learn to do something like that, they'll, after they play that, they'll be on the floor. You know, because they fainted, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I, basically, I teach you how not to, how not to faint. Okay. <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's, what, that's how you have, like, you know, a trumpet player would have longevity in their career. You, when you see somebody like, like the people that I've, I've mentioned, like somebody like Freddie Hubbard, mm -hmm. who had incredible technique, uh, on the horn, and he had a and he had a long career playing the trumpet. You know, mm -hmm. um, when you look at somebody like uh, uh, Wynton Marsalis, when yeah. you see him playing, he just looks relaxed when he's playing. You know, yeah. even when he's playing some of the most uh, uh, intensified uh, or in, in, like some difficult thing passes that he's playing, he just looks relaxed. Yeah. You know, so I, I teach you that relaxation. Uh, a lot of a lot of trumpet instructors don't teach that. They just okay. teach. They just focus on style and, impro and interpretation, or in, improv or in jazz, just focus on on improv more on improvisation. And but if you can't play the trumpet, you can't improvise. Yeah, you know, because impro improvisation is spontaneous composition. Mm -hmm. So when you think spontaneously, you can. Uh, it's like speaking. When you when you're speaking spontaneously, you can say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same when you're improvising. You can play anything, think of anything to play it spontaneously. They can take you up into the upper register without even having any preconceived notion that you're going to go up there at that time. Mm -hmm. So you have to know how to play the trumpet in order to be able to go up there like that, come back down and do it, and, and not faint. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Well, you know, so, you know, you were talking a little bit about how to play. It just got me to thinking, uh, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, obviously, you know, he, he could blow his cheeks out like yeah. this. Do you think that somehow gave him an advantage over over other uh, trumpeteers? 
No, actually, um, Dizzy Gillespie had um, uh, had a, a rare medical condition that uh, where the, the the muscles, the facial muscles in his in, in his facial muscles collapsed. Mm. He wasn't able to control his facial muscles, and so. Uh, but when he played, his corners, the corners of his, of his mouth were firm, which is you got to keep your corners firm like that in order to form the aperture. And so everything here was cool, but here it was mm -hmm. like that, you know, because he couldn't he couldn't control it. Mm -hmm. But he still had everything here like like picture perfect. If you were to look at uh, pictures of Dizzy playing the trumpet from the uh, early to mid forties. Mm -hmm. uh, you would see where he's playing, where he, where he looks like. He's playing like that. No cheeks or puffing. And then later on, you see. You see that, you know. Mm -hmm. But even but even more, his, uh, it, 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 his muscles collapsed all the way up to his eyes, damn near, you know. It was, yeah. it was like a full bullfrog, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he had like a metal, uh, uh, medical condition. Uh, not a medical condition, uh, what would you call it? Some type of thing where the muscles, he couldn't control the muscles, the, the, his facial muscles. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I, that, that's something uh, I know I never heard of, and I'm sure our audience probably didn't know that history either. Right, right, right. And not too many people know about that. Yeah. So based on... Um, you know, the theme of this show, Black Refresh 2020, you know, basically uh, it's really a, a time where African-Americans, um, because of this pause in, in history um, with the fact that we're home confined and, and also uh, shelter in place, that it really gives us a chance to regroup um, and, and, and to uh, unite and, and to also move in a positive direction and kind of make up ground um, from, you know, maybe some, some challenges that we've faced as a community um, and, and also, if you really think about it, like there's never really been a chance for something like this in, in all of American history, you know? Uh, and I think we really ought to take advantage of it, you know, as African-Americans. But, you know, comparing, or I should say, um, uh, linking music to it, Derek, I always was fascinated with the fact that musicians um, seem to be able to have a very multicultural, um, a very accepting, um, I guess you say, atmosphere with them, you know, when you look at bands, even 50s, 60s, 70s, even to today, you can see people of different ethnicities jamming together, you know, and their heads bopping and being so intense into yeah. it. Um, why do you think that's true for musicians, but but we as a society struggle with it? Uh, well, with with music, it is the it is the uh, the language of humanity. Uh, no matter what color, creed, religion, sex, uh, 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 whatever you are, you know, uh, wherever you come from, whatever your culture is, you are linked to the person next to you through music, you know, mm -hmm. if you either, either by playing music or by listening to music. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a very, very important uh, uh, factor when you look at uh, ra race relations in the states uh, back in like the the early 1920s, as I mentioned a little earlier, that's when uh, basically that's when um, when uh, uh, go back into the history again in uh, New Orleans uh, there was a section in New Orleans called Storyville. Where that and that was basic. That was the red light district of New Orleans back mm -hmm. in the day, and the red and, and that red light district uh, is where all the musicians worked, and all the all the brothels and things that were that were around during, in, in that in that 38 block district. Um, and then the U.S. the U.S. Uh, Navy shut down Storyville because it because all the all the uh, uh, the, the troops. From the ships, we're going to Storyville, getting their groove, getting get, get their groove on, getting their groove on. Yeah. But it, it contracted some some diseases, oh, you know, okay. and brought it back into the fold. And it was like, and it was, and it was, it was disrupting the war effort pretty much. Okay. You know? So the U.S. Navy 
um, and uh, shut it down, shut down Storyville, put the musicians out of work. All the New Orleans musicians went, to, went north to Chicago and and set up camp on the south and south side, basically on the south side of Chicago. Chicago was very segregated. North side was white, uh, south and parts of the west side were were black. And but all the white all the white musicians uh, and white people in Chicago, if they wanted to, if they wanted to get their groove on and and this and hear some really lively music, they came down to the south side of Chicago to go to all the black clubs and, mm. and, and hear all these black musicians. And white musicians started coming down, checking out all the black musicians, wanting to know about this music, you know. And they started to integrate and they and they became friends with black musicians through music. They 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 threw all the all the uh, 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 racial hatred out the window. They was like, man, I'm just trying, I'm just trying to play some music, you know. Mm-hmm. Now they couldn't work. Uh, the promoters wouldn't hire black musicians because, the, because of course, promoters were white, and then their audiences were white. The audiences wanted to see white bands, and but in a lot of cases, the uh, um, the uh, uh, there were allowances made to have some. Some black musicians be able to play with, with white with with white bands, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and it just and that association just grew and grew and grew where it it became to the point where you know it was like, you know, like the, the racial hatred just went out the window, and cats just wanted to play just wanted to play together, mm-hmm. you know, and so that's something that uh, that should be translatable into into the the whole of society you know it already is in, in in one respect because when you go to hear you go to hear jazz or when you go to hear music in, in, in general you know you're not uh, you're not separated from a person because they're Chinese or they're white or they're Mexican or whatever like that you're sitting right next to the person and you're both enjoying it in the same way. Mm-hmm. It's like the same. It's the it's the common denominator. It's the common. It, it is the the human language that binds all of us, mm-hmm. and uh, society as a whole can learn something about this democratic process that musicians that musicians have have encompassed over over the over the, over the uh, centuries, really. You know. Yeah. So uh, that's that's pretty much what that is. You know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes I, I, I think to myself, and I kind of say it in jest, but I kind of, I kind of believe something like this should happen. I'm like, especially in America, where things have really intensified in terms of overt racism. Um, yeah. You know, we we've returned to that. You know, maybe maybe things were kind of brewing for some time, but yeah. um, now it's very overt. You know, uh, unfortunately, but um, I feel like. The United States just needs to have a big concert. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that's right. You know, be, because when you know when when we do go to concerts, you see people just having fun and fellowship, and doesn't matter your race and ethnicity. You know, you right. know, it just kind of uh, like you said, kind of soothes the soul, man. You know, that's exactly what it does. Donald Trump needs to listen to some Miles Davis or something. Man. <laughs> he, he does, man. He needs to go listen to <sighs> go go get kind of blue. Oh yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, just put that record on with Donald Trump. As a Trump, just 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 chill. Just, just take, chill, man. Chill, man. You know, just give him his give him his uh, you know those kindergarten building blocks you know, with the big letters <laughs> on it. Give him a set of those blocks so he can play with them while he's listening to Miles. Seriously, man. Seriously, okay. man. Just mellow out, man. Chill, bro. Come chill, on. Chill, bro. <laughs> <laughs> chill, bro. <laughs> hey, man. Don't give him no Legos yet. That might be a little too. Tricky. Yeah, yeah. Really big, exactly. Big, big wooden blocks, man. You know. Yeah, yeah, man. Just, just mellow out, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> dang. So, dang. You know what I mean? Just yeah. You know. Yeah, that's but, right. But, uh, but yeah, man. That, that, that's that's awesome, man. And and, and actually, uh, this has been a terrific interview and 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 really educational. Um, right. So I hope our audience. Um, can learn something, you know, from from yeah. from what you had to teach. So, so real quick, um, how can people listen to your music? Uh, through uh, oh, it's, it's available. Uh, the, the the recordings that I mentioned earlier 
uh, are available on uh, iTunes, on uh, CD Baby, I believe, on um, uh, what are the other all the all the downloading sites. It should be at least the Arrived to the Other Side and um, Echoes of Ethnicity should be available on all those sites. Um, I have a new recording coming out coming out in July, which is a this is going to be a, a, a big band recording, large ensemble recording, wow. pieces. and uh, that's going to be uh, the title of that, of that uh, record is uh, called "Still I Rise" after right. the Maya Angelou uh, poem. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, we're getting everything ready for that uh, now. And preparing for the the CD release will be, uh, I think, around July fifteenth or so, and that'll be available on all the all the uh, downloading uh, sites. And uh, you can also visit uh, Derek uh, uh, Derek Music dot com. Okay, and you better have access to all the uh, all the uh, music there as well. Terrific. And uh, as far as uh, do you have any social media that people can? Can, can follow you or, or anything? Yeah, I'm on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And uh, I think those are, the, those are the three. I'm still getting, I'm still getting my social media game together, you know, but I got a, <laughs> I, I got a slick IT guy that does it all for me pretty much, you know. Yeah. But I have, I, have a, I have a Jazz Prophet fan page and I have a, a, a my big band is called the Derek Gardner and the Big Dig Band. Okay. The Big Dig, Dig uh, was a uh, uh, a jazz magazine that we had here in Winnipeg uh, mm-hmm. a few years ago, and um, and it told all the events uh, that were happening around town. It had feature articles of, of jazz musicians and stuff, and so that that magazine now exists online. Um, you can get most of the issues online, but I wanted the the band to be linked to that magazine, so. We start myself and, and uh, the uh, gentleman I mentioned earlier, Steve Kirby. We started this this big band back in 2014, and uh, and had like a concert series for about two or three years. And uh, and, the, and the, once the funding ran out, then the band broke up. But uh, I always wanted to record that band, so mm-hmm. I resurrected it. Got some got a a, a very sizable uh, Canadian uh, grant. Mm. Uh, to uh, to record the band. There's so much, that's another thing. One of the differences between how Canada supports the arts and and, and America is supporting the arts, and they have so much um, money for the arts here in, in Canada. It's just ridiculous. It's really wow. it's, it's really mind blowing. Wow. And uh, the money's just right there for you to just take it, pretty much, you know, and and uh, and, and do your thing as an artist. And uh, in, the state, in the states, it's not nearly uh, uh, like it's not like that at all. You have like National Endowment for the Arts uh, and a couple other things like uh, uh, Chamber of Music America, I believe. And I'm sure the, uh, but the money is kind of hard. It's harder for musicians to get unless you're somebody like Herbie Hancock or Wayne Shorter, the big the big names. They don't dish out like you know six figure grants, you know, to cats like that. But uh, um, for the for musicians that are are not as popular, you know, it's a little little bit more difficult. You know, um, up here in Canada, it's it's much easier. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that recording will be, will be, will be coming out uh, in July. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. All right. Well, well. Thank you so much for joining us, Derek Gardner. And, um, you know, we definitely will continue to follow what you are doing. Um, definitely uh, just, you know, again, man, I just uh, give you a lot of credit for, for finding your passion, man, and, and for living a life uh, surrounding it. You know, that's, uh, that's incredible. That's Thank incredible. You. I appreciate it. Appreciate yeah. it. But uh, in closing, you know, I, I can't uh, uh, leave off the fact that uh, you're my chapter brother of the Gamma <laughs> Epsilon <laughs> chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity yes. Yes, yes, GE, the power company, man. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> yeah, man. So, uh, so Derek is uh, spring '86. He's part of uh, 19, uh, Nightmare '19 minus one. Right. Uh, one of the, right. the famous, the, the the famous famous lines in GE history. <laughs> uh, and so I came uh, after him by eight years, but uh, always been a great brother. Always been a great brother, and, and treated right. my line 
Spring 94 with a lot of love. So yeah, appreciate that, bro. So so thanks, bro. Best of luck to you with everything you're doing. Okay. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it.